All right, guys, my, my talk's going to be on uh, LBADs in the ED. Uh, so just to kind of start off with, what is, the, what is an LBAD? Um, so basically, uh, these are, this is kind of what people look like when they come in with them. Um, you have basically a, you have a tube that's carrying the blood from the left ventricle into a pump. And then from that pump, it's going into the aorta where it's going to go to the rest of the body. From the pump itself, there's a drive line over here. Uh, and that comes out usually from the stomach. So the drive line, there's two components. There's an internal component, which is inside, and then the part that comes out from the actual, from the belly. That's the external part of it. The drive line itself, you can see, is connected to a controller over here. And then that controller is powered by two battery packs. So they have uh, usually two battery packs. So those are kind of like the four main components of an LBAD itself. And then this is kind of just like a picture I found with, I guess, and all that that didn't work since it's out of the body now. But um, so there's a left ventricle, there's the pump, there's the drive line, and then there's the um, there's the cannula going into the aorta, uh, which then should have gone somewhere else. Um, so an LVAD, there's different types. Um, there is like a there's a hardware, there's a HeartMate two. The HeartMate two is one of the newer ones, so that's probably the one that we'd be seeing more often. Uh, there is actually they're coming up with like a HeartMate three, but. Um, so the heartbeat two is a continuous flow system. So because of that, it's not it doesn't work like our normal um, heart in that there's no like systole and diastole. So because of that, there's no pulse difference, meaning that there's no real pulse pressure. So if you try to feel the pulse on these guys, usually you won't feel one. Um, the heartbeat three actually, I think they're trying to generate an artificial pulse, so that may that that could be cool. Um, so who gets an LVAD? Basically, an LVAD, or sorry, an LVAD is a left ventricular assist device. So anyone who needs help, right? So end stage, usually CHF. Um, it's kind of like a bridge. So if somebody is end stage, you can't, you know, you've tried maximal medical therapy, you don't have anything else. While you're waiting for a transplant, you can put it in. Uh, another per, another category would be like kind of people who have like reversible injuries and they just need some sort of um, something to kind of get them from point A to point B. Uh, so that could be like your postpartum cardiomyopathy, it could be like some myocarditis. Uh, and then the last thing is what they call destination therapy. That's somebody who can't get a heart transplant for whatever reason, and these guys just might be on an LVAD until, um, until they can be. Um, there's also apparently people make shirts, who, so if you get an LVAD, I guess you can buy the shirt as well. Um, so an LVAD person pops up on the tracking board, usually at Monty, uh, what do you do? So the first thing uh, I would say is get somebody else to call the LVAD coordinator, because eventually you are going to need help. Uh, so this would be, I would have somebody else do this, get the nurse, have the charge nurse, somebody call, and then you obviously go see the patient. Uh, three things you're going to bring with you, your stethoscope, uh, your ultrasound, and then hopefully the Doppler. Usually they have like a kit with, all, with the Doppler um, close by. Um, so initial assessment, when you first walk in the room. You, you know, with your stethoscope, just listen, uh, listen, usually kind of in the epigastric area, you're listening for a hum, and that's kind of like, that's telling you the pump is going. If you don't hear it, it's a bad sign. That means that the pump is not working. Um, the second thing you're going to do is you can actually obtain a blood pressure. Um, again, because they don't, they don't have the same cycle of uh, systole and diastole that we normally do, the normal blood pressure cuff isn't going to work. So you need to grab a manual cuff. Um, you inflate it kind of up all the way. You can use your Doppler, either brachial, radial. This picture they're doing a radial, but um, you just you inflate it up, and then as you're deflating, you're listening. And once you start to hear the arterial pulse again, that's how you know what your map is. Uh, so usually with uh, LVAD patients, you just tell, you just say a map instead of an actual systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Normal is between like 60 and 90. Uh, if they're really sick, you can also just throw in an arterial line. So you throw in an A-line, and that'll give you invasive blood pressure um, measurements. Uh, you want to get an EKG on every LVAD patient that comes in. Um, now, let's say you can't find your Doppler. Uh, you brought your ultrasound with you too, right? So your stethoscope, your ultrasound, your Doppler. Uh, you come in with your Doppler. You could just throw it on top of the artery, um, either radial or brachial. This one's a radial artery. Uh, you put it on kind of the Doppler mode, and you can actually see it. So if you compress it, and then you start to um, basically, I guess, let the, let the cuff down, at, at the point where you start seeing your spikes again, that's going to be your map, so it's the same thing. You can also turn on the audio on the Doppler and use it just like a normal Doppler. Um, so you've listened, you've gotten the blood pressure, now you want to take a look at their actual controller itself. Um, so you want to check all the connections. Uh, there's, 
the, the HeartMate 2 actually has this uh, thing on the side where these, they have these symbols, so you can actually see if one of the wires is out, and it'll, it'll kind of say it, so you know which wire is out, and you can just try to plug that in. Um, you want to check the battery life. Uh, you want to check the pump speed. So again, this is where like the different ones um, have different speeds. The hardware, the older one, uh, is like in between 2,000, like 2,200 to 2,800 RPMs, and the HeartMate 2 is usually between uh, 8,000 to 10,000 RPMs. Um, and then, oh, and all these things, basically there's a button right here, which is kind of like the display button. So as you press it, you can toggle between the different ones to find out all these values. So the flow, the power, um, and then there's something called the pulsatility index. This just tells you how much of the cardiac output is given by the pump versus the native heart. So depending on high or low, it tells you either the pump is doing all the work or uh, low is telling you that the heart is actually doing most of the work. Uh, and then lastly, remember your ultrasound. So you bring your ultrasound. Um, the ultrasound, you're basically, I mean, one, you're going to look for like cardiac tamponade, stuff like that. Cardiac tamponade would be more in like somebody who just got the LVAD, usually. Um, so the biggest thing you're looking at is really your right ventricle versus your left ventricle. You're just looking at the chamber sizes, uh, and that'll give you a lot of information. So if your right ventricle is large and your left ventricle is large, so both chambers are really big, then you got to start thinking that the pump itself has some sort of obstruction. So there might be a clot inside the pump, something like that. Uh, what you can, and then when you look at the controller again, you're going to see high power. The pump is trying to work. You're going to see high speed because it's actually working. The pump, it, the pump itself works, but you're going to see a low pulsatility index because it's not actually nothing's going through it, uh, and you may not hear a hum because there might be something blocking it, so you won't actually hear it working. Uh, and then obviously, you treat it the same way you would, uh, you know, start them on a heparin drip if they're unstable, TPA. Um, you're trying to break that clot up. And then eventually you're gonna need, again, this is where you need your LVAD team to come in because you're gonna eventually need somebody to go in to get that clot out. Um, now, you, you know, you look with the ultrasound again. Your right ventricle is big, but your left ventricle is small. Uh, this is kind of like just, just as if we were looking at anybody else, right? You think about right-sided stuff. So your PEs, your right ventricular, um, your right ventricle is not working. Could be a STEMI that took out the right ventricle. Could be pulmonary hypertension. Um, these guys usually on the LVAD itself will have high power, high pulsatility index, uh, and you treat the normal way, right? Like PE, you give them an IV fluid bolus. Um, you can start them on like a heparin drip if you really if you're worried about those things. Um, you want, and then again, you got your EKG already. If your EKG shows signs of a STEMI, these guys, would, you know, they're going to need to be capped. Um, you may actually need some ion, some ionotrope uh, support as well if um, if it's not working. Uh, and then the last one is your right ventricle is small, but your, uh, or sorry, the last one is both ventricles are small. So your right ventricle is small and your left ventricle is small. Maybe you have a collapsing IBC. This is usually a sign of hypo, uh, hypoperfusion, so hypovolemia, anything that causes that. So a GI bleed, could be sepsis. Um, and the biggest thing on this is on the pump itself, you're going to see low flow. Um, so low flow is bad. That means that it's not getting enough volume through there. So these, first thing right off the bat, IV fluid bolus. Um, and then, you know, obviously, look, try to find the cause. So if they're, if they're having a GI bleed, you know, transfuse them, reverse them, reverse their anticoagulation status, sepsis, antibiotics, fluids, kind of all the, um, all the normal stuff. So just going to go through a couple of, like, the common LVAD emergencies we might see. So battery's dead, low, you know, plug it in. Uh, the biggest thing with this is uh, don't, don't take out both batteries at once because then the LVAD's going to stop working and then you're going to be in trouble. Um, you'll see on the, so this is the hardware one. This is, that's why this uh, controller looks different than the um, HeartMate 2. But on this you can see you have two batteries. It'll tell you the status of both, the one that's low, replace. Um, the most common complication of an LVAD uh, or a long-term LVAD is infection. And we know this from studying, but the most common site is the driveline. Uh, the reason it matters is the driveline, again, there's an external piece, an internal piece, it gets infected. You know, it goes into the internal piece, can kind of, uh, you can get like blood, um, basically it can go through your bloodstream, you can get endocarditis. Uh, so the biggest, the easiest way to diagnose this is kind of just look at the actual site. So you might see some pus, if you express some pus out of it, you'll see some redness. Uh, the most common bacteria that you're going to cover for, so staph aureus, uh, coagulase negative staph, like staph epidermiditis, all those. Uh, and then like the last one is like gram negative uh, bacilli. Uh, the second most common complication is actually a GI bleed. So why? And they're usually on AC, right? Because it is mechanical that they have. So they're usually on warfarin. They might be on, uh, and they'll be on an aspirin. 
uh, the sheer pump stress on the pump itself, like the rotor and the pump actually going, will actually cause a little bit of platelet dysfunction. Uh, and then they think that uh, just kind of having an LBAD in general causes a lot of oxidative stress on the body, so you end up forming some uh, AD malformations. So you just have more chances of bleeding. Um, interestingly, also, the LBAD patients can actually develop uh, an acquired von, Will von Willebrand syndrome. And this is, again, from the shearing forces just breaking down a lot of the multimers. Uh, so again, somebody's bleeding, you know, same thing, hold their AC, um, you know, transfuse them if they need it, reverse the coagulopathy if they have it. Uh, you can also use like your TXA here, you could use uh, PCC, FFP, but again, if you reverse somebody who has a mechanical LBAT in, this is another conversation you're going to have to have with the LBAT team. Uh, hypotension. So. LBADs are very preload dependent. So there's a lot of actually, a lot of the sources I saw, some of them just said, you have an LBAD patient, throw some lines in while you're doing your initial assessment, just start a liter of fluids. There's very little harm you can do. Uh, again, you want to think a little bit, but um, it's not wrong. Uh, so some of the causes, again, hypovolemia fluids, uh, your right ventricular failure, we went over pulmonary hypertension, tamponade, uh, you want to treat them properly. Then there's this kind of specific thing for LBADs, which is called a suction event. So remember the inner cannula, the first inner cannula goes into the left ventricle. So sometimes what happens is that left ventricle cannula can actually twist and get pushed onto the septum. So you could actually see this on Sano. So this is the left ventricle cannula. This is your peristonal uh, long, right? So your left atrium, left ventricle, your, your aortic outflow tract, and your right ventricle, right? So this is kind of a normal one. In this suction event, this, can, this um, cannula is now actually pushing against the septum. So you see uh, on the ultrasound, you're going to see a very, very, very small left ventricle. Uh, basically, the pump is trying to pull blood, is trying to pull out of it, but it becomes a vacuum. So it's just pulling against the, it's just pulling against the septum. The heart's not filling. Um, not a good thing. So again, fluids. This is a, you know, you're going to give a lot of fluids. You're going to try to increase the preload, but this is going to be another, one of those things you're going to need um, the team to probably play with to readjust the ca the cannula. Uh, so pump thrombosis, um, so this is kind of, uh, this is also one of those things where if you get the clot inside the actual pump, so this is kind of like a picture of inside that pump that we were looking at before. So there's these kind of rotors, and these are actual pictures, I guess, from the OR afterwards where they have clots inside. Um, but it will cause your pump power to go up because you're, so if you look at your controller, you're going to see the pump power, the watts increased quite a bit. Um, you'll see like a decreased flow again, there's an obstruction. Um, look on your ultrasound, you're going to see both of the ventricles are big because uh, it's not going, getting through. And then clinically, you might have the person just complaining of like a little bit of fatigue. Um, and you might see some like clinically significant hemolysis. So you may see um, worsening renal function. They might be complaining about dark urine, some icterus. The lab test that um, the LVAD people really like is the LDH. So if the LDH is greater than two and a half times the upper limit, that's one of, the, uh, that's one of their kind of more specific tests uh, for pump thrombosis. Um, this happens in like one to two percent of actually all um, all patients within two years post transplant. So it is pretty uh, it is pretty prevalent out there. Um, same thing in terms of managing it. You're gonna you know start them on AC, uh, and if it's life threatening, uh, you can give them TPA. Uh, increased afterload. So this is if you this is kind of the opposite now of kind of all the ones we were talking about. You you know you get your Doppler, you you take the map. The map is greater than ninety. Uh, this could be either you have an obstruction systemically somewhere afterwards, or you just have high blood pressure. Um, the problem with the high blood pressure in LVAD patients, uh, or basically in all patients, but you know, increased risk of CBA, obviously, but uh, it also has an increased risk of the device malfunctioning. So you just want to you know, treat their blood pressure. Again, one of the things you're going to talk to with the LVAD people before you give it, but ACE inhibitors and beta blockers are um, kind of their first line treatments for these. You can, you can also get a lot of dysrhythmias in LVAD patients. Uh, and again, they have, you know, they have surgery to the heart, so they have post-surgical changes. These are all just kind of um, areas that can start off with uh, ventricular dysrhythmias. Um, more common earlier on, but can happen at any point. Um, and these you treat the normal way, right? So you have a VTAC, stable VTAC patient, uh, you know, you treat them. The, the one difference is you're going to do your IV fluid bolus first. Uh, you might try to get an echo first, but you're going to give them the antiarrhythmics. Uh, it seems through the literature that their um, first line is amio, but you can do lido, procainamide. Uh, and unstable patients, you can cardiovert. So you can still cardiovert a patient with an LVAD. You just 
you don't want to put the pads right above the L bed. You want to put them a little bit, um, I guess, lateral to it. Uh, and then obviously this is kind of the most, uh, you know, obviously the most severe of them, the cardiac arrest. So we had um, during that EM uh, critical care conference with the cardiac transplant case, the fellow was saying that you cannot do compressions in an LVAD patient. Uh, so the LVAD manufacturers don't recommend CPR because you might dislodge, you might dislodge it. Uh, so, you know, you try not to do it, but you know, you do your normal stuff. You'll intubate, you'll give the fluids, you know, you check the LVADs. If it's a connection problem, you just, you know, plug in the connections. Uh, some LVADs actually have a manual pump. So if the pump isn't working, you can actually just pump it with your hand and you can see the RPM. So it's kind of like CPR. So obviously if you have all those things, go for it. And if those work, great. If it doesn't work, you know, you need to do CPR. You, yeah, you might dislodge the pump, but at that point it's kind of risk versus benefit. Uh, so just some take home points again. Uh, LVADs really preload dependent, so if you, if you have any question, just start an IV fluid bolus. Uh, first thing, obviously, measure their MAP, their fluid status, figure out whether the pump itself is working. So just kind of go through, look at the controller. Uh, and I, in, in practical use, actually, I've had the, um, the patients are really familiar with it. So I usually actually just go to the patient and I ask them, hey, what's your flow setting usually at? So I had a GI bleed the other day and I asked them, they're like, oh yeah, this, the flow number is a little bit low. And I was like, oh, interesting. And then it's just kind of, those are kind of your thresholds, like how we use our CBCs. Um, and then, you know, bring your ultrasound. This is one of the biggest uh, tools you can use in an LVAD patient. So again, you have this really, really, really tiny left ventricle. You got to think about this weird suction event. Um, and same treatment, IV fluids. You have a very small right ventricle. You're not getting enough preload IV fluids, uh, hypotension, GI bleed, whatever, whatever the underlying cause may be, but the initial man management is going to be fluids. Uh, you have a large right ventricle, but a small left ventricle. Think about your right ventricular failure stuff. So you can have a STEMI on the right side, you can have a PE, you can have pulmonary hypertension, treat those as uh, appropriately. And then if both sides are big, then you got to start thinking about the pump thrombosis or some sort of obstruction. Uh, start thinking about AC, start thinking about TPA, heparin drips. Um, bullshit bang. Any questions? <laughs>